In September 2020, Nintendo celebrated the 35th anniversary of its most beloved and iconic character, Yahoo! that chipper, valiant plumber, Mario. Yeah! Many fans may not realize that while the company's most famous character entered his mid-30s, the company itself celebrated its 135th anniversary the very same month. How did a turn-of-the-century Japanese playing card manufacturer grow into the most well-known and universally loved video game empire in the world? Let's take a trip down the warp pipe and explore the rise of Nintendo. The tale of Nintendo not only predates video games, it predates television, radio, even silent films. It begins in Japan at the turn of the 20th century, where the streets are infected with a rising plague, gambling. To stomp out this emerging evil, the Japanese government banned all playing cards. However, clever swindlers bucked the law by creating hanafuda, or flower cards. As their name suggests, the cards featured floral patterns instead of numbers, allowing players to deceive Japanese authorities. By 1889, a young artist and entrepreneur named Fusajiro Yamauchi decided to open a shop in Kyoto, Japan to sell his hand-painted Hanafuda cards. He named his shop Nintendo Kopai, or Nintendo for short, which roughly translates to leaving one's fortune in the hands of fate. The quality and intricacy of Yamauchi's cards made them an instant hit, prompting him to begin mass production to satisfy rising demand. While the card's success began due to their detailed designs and durable Mitsumata wood, they were also costly to produce and rarely needed replacing. Yamauchi responded by producing Tengu cards, which were both cheaper to produce and less durable, encouraging customers to continually purchase new decks. Yamauchi also expanded his business into new territories like Osaka, where card game demand was growing. As Nintendo's reputation grew throughout Japan, Yamauchi also ventured into producing Western-style playing cards, and the seeds of the Nintendo empire spread. By the time Yamauchi reached retirement age, his small card shop had grown, as if by the power of a magic mushroom to become the number one card company in Japan. Yamauchi hoped his self-made business could remain in the family. Unfortunately, at that time, only a male heir could inherit a father's company, and Yamauchi had only one daughter. So, in accordance with Japanese culture, Yamauchi adopted his son-in-law, Sekirio Kaneda, who proudly took on his father-in-law's name and title, becoming the second president of Nintendo Kopai in 1929. During Kaneda's tenure, Nintendo continued to flourish, distributing playing cards in growing regions around the country. However, the company was soon hit a major wall as Japan waded into World War II. During the war, Japanese authorities prohibited the diffusion of foreign card games. To make matters worse, priorities in Japanese culture shifted, and interest in trivial activities like card games began to shrink. Facing a game over, Nintendo received a one-up in the form of a financial injection from Sekirio's granddaughter-in-law, Michiko Inaba, who came from a wealthy family. This time, the princess rescued the kingdom. The company could stay afloat through the decade. By 1950, Sekirio's health began to decline, and the family drama would rear its head again. Sekirio's marriage to Yamauchi's daughter once again produced no male heirs. Sekirio originally intended to adopt his son-in-law, Shikunojo Inaba, one of the company's artists. Unfortunately, Inaba abandoned his family and the company. So Sekirio eventually made his grandson, and Inaba's son, Hiroshi, his successor. After taking the reins, Hiroshi came in swinging a broad sword, making a number of substantial changes, including changing the company's name to the Nintendo Playing Card Company. He also centralized production to the Kyoto factories. By 1953, Nintendo became the first company to succeed in mass-producing plastic playing cards. And while the company enjoyed growing success, many low-level employees resisted these large-scale changes, eventually resulting in a strike. Instead of heeding the concerns of these disgruntled workers, Hiroshi resorted to dismissing many of those who participated in the strike. While the layoffs were tough, they allowed the company to charge ahead. As Nintendo's influence grew, they entered into a contract with the Walt Disney Company in 1959, incorporating classic animated characters into their playing cards. 
Between distribution deals and toy stores and a flood of television advertising, by 1961, Nintendo sold more than 1.5 million card packs. Two years later, after yet another name change, Nintendo Company Limited went public, earning over 150 million yen, over $700 million today, in their first year alone. But just when it seemed like everything would be sunshine and power stars, trouble sideswiped the company like a runaway Koopa shell. As the world swung into the 60s, the adult leisure market gravitated toward other interests like pachico and bowling, leaving Nintendo precariously dependent on the children's market, which also was shifting. In a panic, Yamochi threw money at a whole host of odd ventures, instant rice, a taxi service, even a handful of love hotels. Of course, nothing stuck. While the remainder of the 60s would prove to be a trying period for the shrinking game empire, their greatest power-up was waiting in a question block right around the corner. This chaotic spiral yielded one treasure, a research and development department that in 1969 acquired a man named Gunpei Yokoi, whose background in manufacturing electronics would change the company's legacy forever. Yokoi has been the main driver behind a number of Nintendo's most famous electronics. In the early 70s, he helped develop Nintendo's revolutionary beam gun, along with the game's laser clay shooting and wild gunman, which used video projection to display a target on screen and a handheld photo sensor shaped like a pistol. Before long, over 1.2 million beam guns were sold, leading Nintendo to develop a series of electronic toys and games, including the Ultra Hand, the Ultra Scope, and the Love Tester, all developed by Yokoi. These innovations led to more growth, and Nintendo acquired bigger buildings. Still, they maintained their roots, moving Hanafuda production back to Yamoki's original building. By 1973, a global oil crisis brought the world's economy to its knees. Rising petroleum costs forced toy and game manufacturers like Nintendo to rethink their product lines. Ever-adaptable Nintendo decided to delve deeper into electronic gaming. Inspired by breakthrough companies like Atari and Magnavox, Nintendo decided to jump into the emerging world of video games. They began by purchasing distribution rights for the Magnavox Odyssey, the world's first commercial home game console, as well as striking an agreement with Mitsubishi Electric to develop similar products, including the first microprocessor for video game systems. By 1979, Nintendo would make two crucial decisions that would help them become the iconic company we know today. First, Nintendo established its American subsidiary in New York where many of its first beloved games would be developed. Then and most important of all, they created a brand new department that focused solely on developing new arcade games. By 1980, the legendary Game & Watch system hit the market, the first handheld video game system. Once again created by Yokoi, who retooled the technology used in portable calculators. The system rapidly became Nintendo's best-selling product of all time, selling over 43.4 million units during its first production period. But one year later, Nintendo's true breakthrough would come raining down like a barrel thrown by an angry gorilla. In 1981, Donkey Kong released to arcades the world over. This simple yet charming game introduced players to a new concept in gaming, a character who could jump as well as a brand new hero, Jumpman. This cheeky, chipper, valiant protagonist would later take on a more relatable name. Adopting the moniker of the landlord for Nintendo's Washington offices, Mario Segale, Jumpman would eventually be known simply as Mario. To this day, the mustachioed hero ranks as one of the most recognizable fictional characters of all time. After dominating the arcade, Nintendo wanted to take on the home electronics market. Their device would incorporate a ROM cartridge drive for games as well as a central processing unit. By July 1983, Japan was introduced to the Family Computer Unit, or the Famicom, with three games, Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and Popeye. Nintendo also adopted a series of guidelines to help ensure protection and exclusivity for the games it would go on to develop, thus avoiding the market saturation that plagued other video game producers at the time. By the time Nintendo was ready to introduce its console to America, it decided to make a few adjustments. It redesigned the Famicom as an entertainment system, thinking that would sound more appealing to American buyers than a home computer system. So, in 1985, America met the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES. According to company data, 
By 1989, one out of every four homes in America owned an NES, and the company cemented itself as a video game giant. Over the next three decades, Nintendo exploded from simple electronic manufacturer to global gaming icon. Landmark titles like The Legend of Zelda, Duck Hunt, Contra, Tetris, Super Mario, and hundreds more would soon become household names. From young children to teenagers, even grown-up children, can all connect over the games and characters that transcend time and space. From the innocent cartoon characters of the Mushroom Kingdom to the vast expanse of Hyrule, the classic games, songs, and unforgettable characters have become as essential to our childhood as breakfast cereal and Saturday morning cartoons. Now over a hundred years later, Nintendo prepares to open its first ever theme park, Super Nintendo World, in Japan. And while the company has grown far beyond the humble roots as a simple card company, they still produce their original Hanafuda cards. By leaving their fortunes in the hands of fate, Nintendo has become one of the most loved companies of all time. Thank you for watching. We're good company, and if you think we've earned it, we'd love to gain your subscription. While you're at it, why not hit that like button and the bell icon so you don't miss our future stuff. If you have friends you think would like our content, share this on social media. We got some great company stories to tell you about, and we can't wait to bring it all to you at the same time next Monday. Cheers, and we'll see you guys next week.